Turning points change the course of our lives. Whether it's a big decision, overcoming an obstacle or tragedy, or taking a leap of faith, these stories of inspiration and resilience are what Turning Point is all about. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Turning Point. I'm so thrilled to have award-winning Canadian hip-hop artist and producer classified as our guest today. Thank you so much for being here. All right, thanks for having me. How are you? Good. You know, it's it's great to have you. You're joining us from your home in Nova Scotia today, right? Yeah, yeah, in Enfield, Nova Scotia, yeah. And how are you doing? Yeah, it's different, you know, getting more used to these Zoom things and Skype and all that. But no, it's for me, it was it was frustrating for a while because for the last since I was 18 years old doing shows, my life was always and kind of unknown to myself till I was in this position. But my life was kind of broke up between shows. It would be like, oh, I got a show in three weeks. OK, I'm going to do this, this and this and that show comes and you kind of reset. and You go, OK, now I got to get this done before that. And without having shows, like for me, every day feels like Groundhog Day. Like, you know, I come out to the studio, do a little bit of work, kids go to school, hang out with the kids, try to find something to do with the kids because there's just not a lot you can do. You know, we've taken our kids for a million walks, I think, since COVID started. And so it's just, you know, impossible to get, get the kids hype and excited to take the dogs for a walk again. And, you know, so just trying to, trying to you know, more so than, than anything, be clever and strong for them to find things to keep them going and keep them motivated so they don't start dwelling on what's going on and they don't seem too upset about it they don't you know they don't sit around and mope about it as much as adults do on facebook and you know we, we do a lot of that and i'm guilty of it as well so well you know what i i i hear you though and i i think what you just described there is so relatable i mean um i actually was going to ask you about this instagram post um that that you recent recently made um in it you mentioned you were uh, taking a break from smoking pot uh, and also that focusing on helping others and being creative was really helping you through this challenging time and the message really got uh, a lot of reaction i think a lot of people appreciate it and myself included um just that you were so honest about the fact that this period of time has been hard and, it, and it's been a struggle. Was there something that compelled you to want to share um, what you were experiencing? Um, honestly, I feel like writing something every day. I kind of wake up and I read the Facebook and comments and, and I bite my tongue a lot because, you know, like everybody else, I have an opinion on something. I'm trying to be smarter with sharing it because sometimes I don't have all the information. I don't know why this was decided and this wasn't decided. And I think that's where a lot of people are frustrated these days are, you know, certain rules that don't make sense to them that, you know, why are we doing this if we're not doing that? And that's kind of keeps just getting more frustrating. And I, I don't know, that day I just kind of got up and, you know, I was on day four of not smoking weed. So I was kind of feeling creative and, you know, energetic and, you know, just kind of felt like sharing that. And I find that helps me as well is when I put stuff like that out to the world and I'm like day four, it almost motivates me to keep at it and work at it. And okay, you know, if people are behind me, you get these motivational messages and it's kind of like, okay, that kind of gives you a little bit more strength to kind of push on and stuff. And, 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 and for me, just like with having friends that deal with depression and stuff and see what they're going through and, you know, something that I just always found help myself is, you know, when you're down and depressed about yourself, and this might sound rude, but stop thinking about yourself a little bit. Start thinking about other people who are in a worse position than you are and help them and not focus so much on your problems and what you're going through. And, and I think that can help a lot of people kind of go, whoa, okay, I know I got these issues, but I can help these. And, you know, it's, it's almost like just helping other people can motivate yourself to pick yourself up as well and i i've noticed that with myself and i've noticed that with people who might seem selfish sometimes and they are down they're depressed and they're kind of just focusing on their own problems and it and you can see it going man like if or, you know whoever it is if you focused on other people rather than your own problems that might actually help your problems yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a really good perspective. And there is so much value in, like you said, in, in helping others, um, you know, first of all, for helping someone else, but also it does, it is like, a, there's a lot of sat personal satisfaction that comes from being able to, to offer something to someone else too, for sure. 100%, 100%. Like it even comes back to like, 
a couple years ago, me and David Miles did something at the IWK, which is the Children's Hospital in, no in Nova Scotia. And, you know, this was before COVID and all that time, but just going in there and seeing these kids and talking to them and, you know, seeing a smile come on their face, it makes you walk out of a place like that. Like, you feel like a, not like a superhero, like, oh, I'm doing this great stuff, but you come out of that feeling like, this is great. Like, this is great that I go in there and you can help somebody else and help t turn their mood around. And, and in turn, it works works on yourself. Speaking of turning things around, I do want to ask you uh, about your biggest turning point. Um, so I'm just going to let you, I'm just going to let you uh, tell us about it. Uh, mine would be, there's a few, but I think the biggest one for me was um, when I was like 20 or 21, I had a, I went to Compu College, which was like a computer college instead of business. Now it wasn't very good. I learned how to type kind of that's pretty much all I got out of it. But I ended up getting a little bit of a, you know, a good job out of it. I was working like a help desk and they started laying people off and I was heavy into my music, but I still always had that thing. Like I got to have a job, got to have a backup plan. Um, but when they were laying me off, I was like, okay, cool. I can get unemployment for a year. And you know, that was like, okay, this is my moment to see what I can do. And then my last day at the job, my boss came and he found me another job in, in the building. And it was, you know, for a 21 year old making, I think it was like 42, 43 grand at this time. It was like a legit job, you know, benefits, all this other stuff. So I was like, ah, you know, that kind of grabbed me the last day. I was like, I was so excited to just go at music hard unemployment. They offered me the job. My dad and my mom were like, you got to take the job. You can't not. And I was like, I can't, I'm just kind of so excited to go with the music. So that was it. I left the job that, you know, even the one that was still kind of there for me went on employment for a year and, and never went back to, to working a job after that. It was just kind of grew from there to unemployment ran out. I was making enough money off music and kind of kept going from that point. Wow. Then that is, I mean, that is a risk, obviously, like you said, you know, you have the stability. Oh yeah. Like I was scared. Like I was not like a guy that was like, Oh, I'm going to make a bunch of money off rap music and be able to support myself and my family. I never had that in my mind. I always enjoyed doing it. I like doing shows and I got off on these small goals. I kept hitting and I was just like, Oh, this is, let's keep going. But I always have my job in the background just in case, you know, pay the bills, pay rent and all that stuff. And then, yeah, that one day it was just like, boom, do I want this? I'm just going to go for it. And it was really scary. It was definitely something that, you know, for the first four or five months after leaving the job, I was still like, am I doing the right thing? And just kept pushing on. And then, you know, 22 years later, I've never went back to a job. And I don't know what my life would be like if I stayed at that job. Like that was definitely the turning point for me to go, boom, music full time, let's go. That's incredible. And yes, look at you now. Uh, so what did you do during that year? Um, when you, you know, all of a sudden were able to focus on music full time? Um, started selling beats, recording other people. And, and like, I still have the list, like an old notepad file, like, you know, just a basic notepad. I had it open and I was like, you know, sold a beat to Jay Brew, 150 bucks, sold a beat to Spesh K or, you know what I mean? Kind of Maestro Fresh West bought a beat for 500 bucks. Um, I got a so can check for a thousand bucks. Oh, I played at so-and-so's bar for 1500 bucks. And it kind of just, and if you look at this sheet, it kind of shows the whole year and you can kind of just see where it started and see the money kind of growing as it comes in and just these different avenues of, oh, I got something in a, you know, a video game commercial or something, a little bit of money there. And yeah, you can just see the progress in, in the whole year as it goes, like everything's dated and I tried to keep it as organized as I could because I was trying to make it, I was trying to make this my job. You know what I mean? This is what I was trying to do. So I was trying to take it as serious as I could. That is very cool that you still have that notebook. It must be like really kind of humbling to look back uh, at what you did in that year. Yeah. Well, it wasn't even a notebook. It was a notepad. Like, you know how you open notepad on Windows? Oh, yes. So, yeah. So I just had like the basic notepad. And like, I'm actually writing a book right now in my whole career. We just finished the first draft, but like, that's one of the pictures in the book is this whole file of like my first year of full-time music and where the money came from and stuff. Wow. Okay. And you're writing a book. I had no idea. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, we started it before COVID. We started almost a year and a half ago. Um, I'm just waiting for my first copy. I'm supposed to get my first copy any day now, then we'll do final edits and then it'll be done for summer. 
I have an acoustic album through from my catalog and this, this book that's going to be like the next thing that we're pushing as soon as we can start doing shows because it's, it's something I want to do face to face with people and meet and you know do the book tour of Cole's bookstores and all that stuff and you know something different. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's really exciting. I feel like you have, um, it sounds like you've still been really busy uh, during this pandemic. Yeah, like my like my time EP, which was the last one that came out that had good news on it, you know, some other songs on it as well. That was finished just before the pandemic hit. So once the pandemic hit, I was kind of done in the studio. Uh, but me and my brother shoot all my videos. So we just started shooting videos and content and that kept me busy. And then there was like a month where it was like everything was done. And then I kind of got really, I don't want to say depressed, but I definitely just, eh, I don't want to do nothing, laying around on TV, watching Netflix, and just started feeling like shitty, not about myself, but just not motivated to do much. And then one day came out to the studio and then literally 20 minutes started messing with a beat or something. And it was just like, oh, this, I got to be creative. Like I just realized this year, if I'm not being creative and, trying to do something it's it's hard on me because it's all i've been doing since i was 15 years old so to just stop cold turkey and quit it i never realized it till this year like how much i need that for my own sanity not necessarily for money or paying bills but just for my own day-to-day -day get by and I imagine when through writing the book too, and also this reflection that's been happening uh, during the pandemic, being able to to look back and like think about things like what makes you happy and what you need in your life to to feel good, um, it it does seem to kind of also reflect your what happens on your EP, um, where you are really looking back at your career and and kind of reflecting on on what's important to you. Yeah, and I think that came back to writing the book as well. Like we just spent a lot of time with like guys I used to tour with, tour with my friends, my parents, and and you know just going through these old stories and a lot of them that I completely just forgot about. Like oh my gosh, yeah, we went to Europe and did that. I completely forgot about it. And you know just doing that with the book, bringing it back, it definitely gave me that reflective look when I was you know working on new music. When you were talking about your turning point and, you know, deciding not to take uh, that job and, you know, deciding to, to take that year to really focus on music, see what would happen. You said in the first four or five months, you know, you wondered if you had made the right decision. Was there a moment when you realized that you had done the right thing? Um, I don't know if there was a specific time, but if I had to pick it right now, it would be the day that my unemployment check just stopped coming. And I went, okay. Actually, I know what it was. My, when the unemployment check stopped coming, I had 5000 bucks in the bank. I remember thinking, I got 5000 bucks in the bank. Like, I'm, you know, at that age, it felt like I was good for a while. And, and that was my goal was just to keep adding to that pot. And then, you know, that was 5000 bucks in the bank and just kept adding it to it over the years. And it's, you know, just kept kind of going up and up. And I've been able to pay my bills and still put enough money away. And but I remember when I hit the 5,000 bucks range, that felt like, okay, unemployment's gone. I got this. I could live off this for at least, you know, probably five months off 5,000 bucks at that time. And, and then, yeah, just kind of kept going from that point. That is very cool. I am really loving kind of looking back at, at this time, uh, at this time with you, especially um, at this point, because um, in your new EP, um, one of the songs, Get Ready, you actually talk about the length of your career. So I know this turning point happened uh, around 2001. You've been making music for uh, more than 25 years. Your first album came out in 1995. Does it feel like it's been that long? No, not at all. Anytime anyone says that, it feels like 13 years. You know, like when someone says, like, I put out my first cassette when I was, yeah, 15 years old. I'm 42, 43 now. So that's 28 years ago. Like, that blows my mind. You know what I mean? And it blows my mind that I'm 43, still sitting in my studio with my microphone and my drum machine making beats the same way I was when I was 16. So it's... You know, I don't look at it back a lot of times, but when someone says that, it's like, geez, it doesn't feel like 25 years. Like, you know, that still feels like some Rolling Stone shit or the Beatles to me was 25 years ago, even though that was like 50 or 60 years ago now. But now it's, it's you know, the body's getting older, but the mind still feels like, a, you know, 25 years old. Like I still have a lot of the same values and outlook, you know, that I did at that age, I think. 
And it goes back to Maestro Fresh West. He always says, music keeps people young. You, you keep making music, man. That keeps you in touch. It keeps you learning. And I don't think it's just music. I think it's being creative. For me, is what I've learned. It is being creative keeps you young, keeps you fresh, and keeps your mind working. Yes. Oh, I love that. Music keeps you young. And I, I agree with you. I feel that, that being creative and... Um, because you've also in that time so much has happened and you have um like you said you may you know still have the same values but your music has um you've innovated and and gone through different stages and you mentioned like even cassette tapes like having to change with technology over time yeah yeah well the, yeah going from like cassette to cds to digital but even in the recording process of like recording on a four track to you know oh i've got eight tracks now any computer any person with a computer has a 200 track studio that you know just the process of making music has changed so much too but again that's what keeps it exciting is learning these little new things and these new tools that oh i can do this now i couldn't do this 20 years ago so like some beats and samples that i might have messed with back in the day i'll mess with them now and i can do a total different thing with it now just because the technology is different yeah, that's really neat. I actually, um, for a throwback yesterday, I was uh, listening to and watching some of the videos from your uh, from your newest EP. And then I, I went way back because I was curious if your your first album was called your very first album was called Time's Up, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and somebody actually put a couple of the songs on YouTube. Is there some on YouTube? Yeah. 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 That, that was like before puberty me. <laughs> that was like... <laughs> Yeah, that was before I smoked weed, before puberty, so everything is super high pitched, super energetic, and yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you oh, it, yeah. it is like you still have this like great energy. Um, I I loved it, and I was curious because that um that album was called Times Up. Your newest EP, uh, last one's called Time. Yeah. yeah, is there a connection? Yeah, uh, well, just time. The main thing that I noticed is just when I was writing this song. And by no means of anything on purpose, every course on that time EP says the word time in it. It's not like the main thing, but I just went back like, uh, good news. I've been waiting on good news. I don't know. I can't even think of the course right now, but it's every course mentioned time, which was, and for me, like time is my most important thing now. It's like, you know, money's cool, but having time with my kids you know, time heals people, time changes things. It's like time is one of the most important things that I think a lot of us forget about. And yeah, just going back to my first album being called Time's Up Kid. Originally, I was going to call it Time's Up Man, just because I'm growing up now, but it was kind of corny, so I didn't want to do that. But I was just like, I still wanted to have that reflection back to like kind of where I started and where I am now and be like, time has always been an important part of my career, I think. Yeah, okay. I, I wondered about that because I did, I, like I... I didn't realize that your first album was called Time's Up Kid. And then when I went back and realized this one was time, I wondered, um, and since you were reflecting on your career, so that's really neat to hear that it almost happened organically, it sounds like. And which most things do in my career, they kind of happen by mistake. And then I just recognize and go, oh, okay, that's cool. Let's, let's make it make sense now. I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you, I know your new EP came out uh, last August, so obviously during the pandemic. I was curious about the timeline for this, um, the songs. Were any of them written during the pandemic or were they all written before? No, no, they were all done. Everything was done, yeah. Now I'm really fascinated by this because I felt like the content was so timely um, because so many of them are really, um, like you had kind of mentioned along the way here about reflecting on what's important in life, which I think so many of us have been doing during the pandemic um the song i love it really stuck with me i first of all i just loved seeing your wife and your daughters in the video that's that cheap was... work right there i don't pay any <laughs> actors i'm like the kids are in it yeah <laughs> we just shot a new one and it's like i got my friends playing doctors and like yeah like i live where i live in enfield it's where i grew up and a lot of my friends still live here and you know like we're all going four wheeling tonight like eight of us so I'm very close with them. So anytime we're shooting a video, I'm like, hey, I need you to play a doctor. Hey, I need this. And, you know, the same, my, my kids and my wife are sick of me. Like, hey, we're shooting a video this weekend. Now they're like, oh, come on, dad. <laughs> but, yeah, I got to keep it real. Got to use the real people for it. You know what I mean? Totally. Oh my gosh. And it's so perfect since you are talking about what's important to you. Um, these are my two favorite lines. So you said you can always get your money, but you can't, you can always get your money, but you can never get your time back. 
and the truest happiness in life is from the company you keep. And um, I know you, you were just talking about how, you know, time is really important to you. And these two things, too, I think were really during the pandemic. So many people are reevaluating, like, does, do I like my job? Do I like my partner? You know, am I happy where I'm at? Yeah, no. And, you know, obviously a lot of new stresses are happening, but I've noticed that a lot of couples breaking up during this pandemic. You know, I think a lot of it's due to just being in situations. People are more anxious. People are not themselves a lot so i think that's due to a lot of it but i think a lot of it too is going geez how much time do we got here am i happy doing what i'm doing if not you know maybe i should be finding what i'm what would make me happy so yeah definitely notice that so now knowing because i think i just assumed this song was written during the pandemic but now knowing it was written before um, what was on your mind when you were writing this song i love it see a lot of it was what does that sound say about moving silence but my mom is saying that my mom is very proud a lot of it the first four bars of each verse were just some random i don't want to say rap shit but just like oh, okay this sounds nice this flows and then once i realize okay i got a vibe or something i'm feeling then i'll go back at my phone and just in my phone in my normal day life whenever i come up with a line or something i'll just write it in my phone like the you could always make your money, but could never get your time back. That was just one line I had on my phone. Um, the the biggest happiness in life is from the company you keep. Like that was another part of it, you know. And so once I had the idea of the song kind of flowing the way I was rapping, then I try to bring in lyrics that mean more to me. So if you notice in that song, both of those lyrics you quote are near the end of each verse. Because that's when I start going, okay, this verse is staying. I want to put some gems of lines that are important to me and... So, yeah, those are just little one-liners that I just think about and go, you know, it's great having money, but the fact I get to hang out with my friends every day and shoot the shit, it's, it's you know, that's what makes me happy, you know what I mean? I don't, I'm not happy open up and go into my Royal Bank account and just look at much money I have and just go, okay, got money. I'm happy when my boys text me and go, what's up for tonight? I'm like, oh, something's going down tonight, we're doing something, and, you know, like... Our house, we kind of built it. We have a basketball court down there. We have the pool. So I like to have friends over. So in the summer, like, my place is like, come on over. Bring the kids. Let's play some sports. Let's go in the woods. Let's, you know, I, I enjoy being around people. And, and I think that's why I had a hard time with the lockdown at first, too, of, you know, you can't be around your friends and anybody. Some people, that they didn't mind that. But for me, like, I'm a people person. I like to talk to people. I like to shoot the shit with people and I like, you know, being around people like that. So that that was hard for me. That was hard. We we started doing the Zoom calls on Friday nights, like me and all my boys. We'd be like 10 of us on a Zoom call and that was cool because it was different, but that got old after a couple of weeks. So de definitely a people person. Yeah, there's definitely nothing that can replace those in-person like gatherings and, and interactions. No, no. And, and like I said, some people aren't they don't mind it they like kind of being away and you know staying on their own but I'm, I'm just not that type of person um you mentioned your daughters earlier i know um we talked about how uh, they were also in the um in that video how, how old are they now my oldest is 12 and then my middle's 10 and the youngest is seven okay and how are they managing and, and how are you managing with them uh during the pandemic um, it started rough cause we were all doing homeschooling and it was like, Kim, my wife, she just handled the homeschooling thing and I did gym class. So it was like, cool, I'll take the kids to play the basketball court, take them on the skate ramp. And, and you know, that got frustrating after a while. Just, I know Kim had a hard time trying to stay on top of the studies and this, like, she's not a teacher. She doesn't know, you know, she just kind of got thrown into it. So that was tough for a while. Once things got back to normal, like our summer, we had no cases. It was almost you know, if you didn't watch the news, you wouldn't even know there's a pandemic, which, you know, could be said for a lot. But, you know, it was almost like a mind frame of like, hey, we can have friends over. We had 10 people over, blah, blah, blah. The kids would have their friends over. And they were fine. Like, they, the kids are ready for another lockdown. The kids are done with school. They're like, I wish we just locked down again so we could stay home. And it's like, <laughs> please don't say that. So the kids are good. Like, I'm not worried about them. You know, my oldest daughter plays basketball. They, they're back playing basketball again. So that's fun. Like, just getting out, getting exercise. You know, that was my biggest scare at first was just how much phone time and screen time they would have because 
and I couldn't argue. Like I'm a I'm an anal father about that. I let my kids have an hour and a half a day on the computer or their phone or whatever the the tablet. That's it. But when the pandemic happened, it was like oh, you can't see your friends. You know, go ahead. Like you know, so they were putting four or five six hours a day. And it was hard to argue, but it was like getting scary of like, how are you going to get back to normal doing this for five months? Like that's a long time for a kid. So that had me worried a lot, but they seem to be doing pretty good with it. Like, you know, they took them to the skate park the other day. They were back on their skateboards and, you know, just trying to get them out doing stuff. And it, de it definitely gets redundant sometimes. And you feel like you're repeating yourself and come on kids, let's do this. But you got to keep trying. Yeah, and it's amazing how resilient kids are, like you said, like it sounds like they they've managed to adjust well. What do they do they understand your career and like like what do they know about about your music and about what you do? Oh yeah, they're pretty they get it. Like I've taken them to wee days and like some shows that are more like family oriented, but uh they're cool about it, but they kind of get it too. Like my oldest whenever just because I'm from a small town, you know what I mean? So, like, when good news came out, you know, my daughter's teacher would play it in the class. Like, oh, Classify put out a new song and video. And they would show the whole class. And Taylor would hate that because she's like, Dad, they played your video in school. And everyone just st stared at me. So she's standing there and everyone's just staring at her waiting for her reaction. So, like, when they do it now, she asks to leave the room. And I'm like, ah, like, just tell them to stop playing the videos. Like, I don't want to make you feel weird, like... But she's cool. She gets it. And they like it sometimes. Like, I see my youngest. We went skiing the other day, and the girl working there was helping me with boots. And then she looked over. She's like, oh, my God, classified? I was like, yeah, just just freaking out. Like, oh, my God, I can't be cool classified here. My youngest daughter just kind of comes over and curls back in. Like, hi, Daddy. Like, kind of playing it up. Like, you're my daddy. Like, okay, I, I get what you're doing, Emma. You're trying to play it up. So I think they take it for what it's worth. They're not too serious about it, but they have fun with it sometimes, too. That that's really sweet. Actually, hearing that that's really cool. Um, you mentioned your song "Good News" a couple of times, and I like this song. Is it's it also I wondered if it had been written before the pandemic because it did seem to come out at a really uh, just at a really timely moment when uh, when we really needed good news. Um, and the music video is um, all, is children uh, in a senior's home, and they're sharing stories and food. That's, see, that's, and again, remember what I was saying about me just having luck sometimes and, oh, by mistake, like that. We showed, we shot that video in February and my whole plan was like, hey, let's just take a camera, have a pizza party with, bring my kids because I'm just using my own kids and all their friends and brought them into this old people's home and the old people all had, you know, played some games, ate pizza, whatever, and shared stories of things that were important to them. And then, you know, three weeks later, the pandemic hits and the old people's home gets hit harder than everything. So, like, originally that song and video was supposed to come out earlier. And I was like, you know, I remember we put the song out on a Friday. Or, sorry, it was supposed to come out in March, whatever, the, the, the week the pandemic hit. And I was like, we're not putting out a song called Good News. Like, small businesses are shutting down. People are losing their jobs. It's not the time to say, hey, forget about the problem, celebrate the good stuff. So we held the song for almost a month, I think. And then kind of felt like people were settling in. We're like, okay, people do need some good news. Let's put this out. And that was on a Friday. So we put the song out. And then Saturday night, the Nova Scotia massacre happened. Like the day and a half after I put good news out. And usually when you put out a song, you put it out Friday, you come back Monday, and you just start promoting it all week. So people, but once Monday hit, I, I called my label manager. I was like, hey, I'm not talking about good news at all. It's just not the right time you know they all understood and we kind of just set everything back for like two weeks and then slowly just like okay let's put it out and i'm glad i did because once i did just people from nova scotia reaching out saying hey this is awesome that you're you know putting something out like this right now so it's it's weird like time and time that's again comes back to timing of like wow like look at the timing of this and how important timing is whether it's a negative or a positive Yes. And I did read, um, I read on, you know, I was reading through some Instagram comments on some of your posts and people have said so many times just how much some of this music has really helped them get through this, um, this pandemic. So it is a kind of uh, serendipitous that most of these songs were written before the pandemic, these videos were totally. recorded and, um, yeah. and that you were. 
And yeah, like the video thing of like, no one could go into old people's homes. So I was like, when we were putting out the video, I was like, I think it was my manager called me. He's like, bro, do you, are you sure you want to put this video? Like showing you bringing your kids into an old people's home when people can't go see their parents right now. And I was like, ugh. so I sat on it for another week. I was like, I don't know, man. Like, and I started doubting everything. And then it just was like, talk to somebody. I think I, just my friends and kind of shared it with them. And they're like, man, put it out. Like people are going to appreciate that. And that's what it was. Put it out. People are like, this is awesome. You're, you're actually giving a face to these stories of old people's homes and now people have a face of what this is and it's like okay i guess it was the right thing but you know i'm definitely really nervous about a lot of that that whole situation and how to release a, a song like that in a video like that yeah i can totally see that having to really consider both sides but yeah i i feel the same way i just felt like it was really a perfect moment because it was a moment of joy and especially at a time when things a lot of seniors homes were being hit hard it was it was nice to remember some of some of the good times and you, it was just such genuine joy on the kids uh the faces of the kids and the seniors interacting and the 100 percent. like before even COVID hit i was like man this video is awesome like and my plan was that like the two most honest people in the world are young kids and old people young kids and just because they don't care anymore they're just like it is what it is so it was like, and I didn't take into account that it is older people. So my plan was to shoot for, you know, seven hours of the day. But after two hours, the old people were like, I got to go for my nap now. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, we didn't think we don't got these people for six hours. So it was just cool that for two or three hours, they get to sit with the kids. And just, I was just like, Mike, just tape everything. And we just walk around videotaping their moods. And, and you just get that real honest expressions. And to me, that's what the, the whole video was supposed to be is just, real honest, you know, people just sharing their feelings and not worrying about the camera being there. None of that. Yeah, it definitely, that definitely comes across. Uh, you mentioned Mike, that's your brother, right? Yeah. Yeah. So your brother, and I think your dad also, um, has, uh, has some uh, musical background as well, right? Yeah. So this is a bit of a family business. Yeah. 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 No, my dad plays. It's definitely, it was like my, brother mike who shoots all my videos now he's also been touring with me for 15 years like he performs on stage he's my background singer and then my other brother is my guitar player and then my dad plays all over the record my mom thinks she's my manager <laughs> she, she sends me ideas every other day so you know and she's got some good ones so i listen to her the only one that doesn't do anything is my sister but she comes out for the party so it's still a family thing I, that's that is really cool and you do you like over the years it must be nice to have this honest input from from people that that you really trust 100%. yeah that's 100 percent. and like anybody know like my brother mike is like a hater like he hates it, it kind of sucks for him he just hates almost it's weird he almost hates liking stuff like he has to really like something for him to like it so anytime I'm working on something, if I come up with something, he's like, oh, this, what is this? This is cool. I'm like, okay, pff, we're keeping this. Because usually Mike's like, yeah, I don't want to hear you rap about that again. Ah, another one of these songs. And, you know, he's usually the negative guy. So having someone like that, someone is, sometimes it is a demotivator and it's hard. But you know when you do get something and he reacts to it, it's like, okay, there's something about this. And, yeah, same thing with my mom and dad. Like, they're all very honest with me. We all talk our shit to each other. So they can tell me if so they don't like something. And my friends and my band and all that. It's it, I'm, I don't like yes men. I want real opinions. And, and, and I'm lucky enough to have, you know, a circle of people that, that will share their real opinions with me. Yeah, there's definitely a level of honesty too that comes from from family or, or those like really close friends that um, that you can't get anywhere else. Well, the ones that have known you before the, the fame and the, you know, the much music videos and the award shows, like they all know me since I was five, 10 years old. So it's, it's kind of like, ah, eh, Luke, that sucks or, you know. I, I, you know, one of the things that's really struck me through both this interview and we've met before um, when I was at CTV uh, as well is 
you know, you are always so down to earth and you, um, you know, you talk about your family, about how you get the most joy from being with them, from, um, from being with your friends. Um, but are there any moments from your professional career, you know, whether it's a collaboration you did or um, a really cool celebrity moment that, that stands out to you when even you were like, okay, this, this is really cool. Oh yeah. A few times, like, um, being like a nineties kid, like naughty by nature was one of my favorite groups. So I've been to New York and went to the studio and naughty by nature was there. So seeing that was like trippy, um, doing a song with Snoop Dogg in a hotel room in Truro, Nova Scotia. That's probably my biggest moment. Like I'm a Snoop Dogg fan, 15 years old doggy style came out. I was like, what is this? You know, and I'm probably started smoking weed because Snoop Dogg started smoking weed. You know what I mean? Like he just really influenced my my whole outlook on on my career. I think so. Being able to do a song with him, and not doing it like I record here, he records an Ellie and sends it to me. He was up here shooting Trailer Park Boys, so I brought a studio to him in his hotel. We hung out in his studio for like or in, in his hotel for like an hour, made this song, and then the song is it's a gold record. So it's like. I didn't just get to make a song with Snoop, but I made a hit record with Snoop. So that's probably, you know, if not my top spot of like, you know, if you told me that I was 15 years old and I was going to have a Snoop Dogg, a record with Snoop Dogg, I wouldn't have believed it, but I would have been, I would have been smiling. Oh, that is really cool. How, so how did that happen? Like, how did you, how did this idea for the collaboration come to be? I had the song done and the course was it's a weekend on the East Coast got a little crazy last night and it was like okay cool this is like an East Coast party but I was like I want to make it bigger let's so we, I got the guy to re-record it and do a West Coast version too so one course says East one says West and then I was on the phone with my manager just thinking like man it'd be cool to get someone on the West from this and be like man what if we got Snoop Dogg and it was literally just a random that'd be crazy hey and he was like man why don't we try it? This was right after Inner Ninja, three foot tall and higher. So we had some big hit records and we felt like we had some steam. So he started reaching out to Snoop's Snoop Dogg's team and it went back and forth for a couple months, but it didn't feel like it was going anywhere. And then Bubbles, Trailer Park Boys, I knew that they were shooting in Truro and they rented out this whole hotel. They had Snoop up, um, some other guests, but I knew Snoop was in Truro, which is 25 minutes down the road. So I called my manager. I'm like, yo, Snoop is 25 minutes down the road. So he called Snoop's manager and they said, boom, okay, send the song. So I sent the song to Snoop. And they were like, okay, he's in. He's going to come to your host tonight. This was a Wednesday morning. And I was like, he's coming to my house? He's like, and they're like, yeah, Snoop will be at your host at like six. So I hung up the phone, you know what I mean? Called all my friends. I was like, I know it's Wednesday night, but we're having a party tonight. Snoop's coming to the studio. We just got to have a party, you know what I mean? So everyone's like hyped on it. And then at five, I get a call from his manager. It's like, Snoop can't do it tonight. We're going to do it tomorrow. So I call everyone back, cancel everything, do it for Thursday night. He calls me Thursday. Snoop can't come. Can you bring a studio to him on Friday? So I was like, kind of getting a little bit like, okay, are you just fucking with me now? Is this even real? But being, you know, a big fan and trying to, I was like, all right, I'll bring you a studio. So I had an RV at the time. I just sold it last year. But so I loaded my studio gear up into that. David Miles came with me, uh, my wife came, a couple friends, and we drove to Truro, um, met Snoop's manager, and then he brought me into the studio, and Snoop came in, and we just hung over for like an yeah, hour, hour and a half, and, and it was crazy, because Trailer Park Boys were shooting a movie, so Ricky and Julian were running one way, and then like um, Tom Arnold was there at one point, and like just random characters were all at this little motel, it was a trippy night. But like, you know, the highlight was me being able to record and work with Snoop. But yeah, that's that's kind of how it came together. Oh my gosh, I feel like I held my breath through that whole story. That is, what a surreal experience. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's going next? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a, an effort to make it happen, but glad, glad we got it done. Yeah, and that, vi that music video is one of my favorites too. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. And that was the thing with that too, was like, we, we were gonna get Snoop in the video and it's a business, so it costs extra amount of money and just how hard it was to do the song. I was like, I don't know if I wanna pay the money, fly to LA and then, you know, just do a rap video. Cause that's kind of what it was gonna be. It was like, well, Snoop basically said, you can come to my house, which is like his compound. They got a studio, we can videotape us rapping. And I was kind of like, yeah, that's cool, but 
I, I want to do a more creative video. I don't want to just like I'm rapping, you rap, and then pay a bunch of money to do this. So talking to the director, I was like, how can we make something cooler? So he flew me to LA. I shot one scene where it looks like I get hit by a bus. And then me and Snoop are in for the rest of the video. And, and you know, we flew back home. But I literally flew to LA to shoot for 20 minutes and then flew back home. But yeah, no, shout out to Dave Hung for shooting that video. It's creative. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. I went back and watched that one last night too because I, I loved it. And I was like, I need I need a refresh of this video. And yeah, yeah, it's so good. Oh, I love the whole backstory to that though. That is a very, yeah, that's really cool. You have a great memory, hey? You remember like every minute of that. That's just, you know why? Because, well, that one, because it was like a big moment. Like, I don't think I'll ever forget that. But writing the book, like there's so much stuff I had to revisit that was like, oh yeah, that happened. And Mike or my DJ IV will tell me, don't forget this. And I was like, oh, shoot, forget about that. So, yeah, doing the book definitely brought back a lot of memories. Speaking of memories, I do want to come back to your turning point here um, because it's been almost 20 years since you uh, were laid off from your job. You made this decision to give a full time career in music a try. Uh, I don't need to ask you if you have any regrets. Obviously, uh, things have worked out very well. Uh, but I did want to ask, is there anything that you're really excited for as you look to the future? Right now, I want to travel. Like, I just want to take my kids to go to Australia, Germany. Just, I think the lockdowns kind of made me go, okay, you know, my oldest is 12. By the time she gets to like 16 or 17, she's going to be doing her own thing, hanging with her friends, more concerned with that. So, you know, that's my biggest thing is showing my kids like the world is bigger than Enfield. You don't have to date a boy just at the school because there's only six left or you know, like he's coming from a small town. Like I've seen that growing up of like a group of friends and they all dated the same girl because there's just, it's a small town. You know what I mean? So I want, and to realize, you know, if someone's talking shit about you about high school or you have a group of girls that are mean to you or something, it's not that big of a deal. Like the world, you're going to get out of high school. You'll probably never see these people again. And there's a whole world out there. So just showing my kids that there's a whole other world out there, showing them other culture, showing them, people coming from different walks of life. So they are grateful for what they have and they realize like, okay, I shouldn't be complaining about this or complaining about that. That's my biggest thing is just giving my kids knowledge so they can grow up and be happy and find something they love doing. Oh, that is exciting. And I'm with you. I cannot wait to get on a plane and, uh, and go somewhere, <laughs> somewhere new. Yeah. Like I don't like flying it. I hate flying. Like I'm scared of flying, but right now I'm like, like we're going to Cape Breton for the East coast music awards in May. And I'm so excited to go to Cape Breton right now. Just, you know, I've been there a million times, but not leaving, you know, my area in like almost a year, just getting out and, and seeing people talking to fans, touring, doing all that stuff. I'm excited for. Yes, I agree. And what about career wise? I know you just mentioned going on tour um, and being able to see people again. Um, do you have any other big projects you're excited about? Uh, the book and the acoustic album is basically the main thing. So the acoustic album, I'm just finishing up now. Um, the book, we're just wrapping up and then we'll start shooting videos for all that stuff. Start releasing stuff maybe around September, maybe midsummer. Um, and then we're looking at doing more, some more overseas stuff. You know, we haven't done a lot of overseas, a little bit, but I've just focused on Canada so much that, you know, I just kind of realized, okay, I want to go to Germany, tour there for two weeks and kind of lay a little bit of a mark down there. But other than that, it's kind of free flowing right now. It's, you know, I'm not like planning another big album right yet. I'm just kind of rolling through it, taking it day by day and just making sure every day I'm doing something else to keep moving forward. Oh, well, I, I, you know what? I love that we like, we went like super big picture and like the traveling, the global, and then you brought it right back to, you know, taking it day by day, because I, I think that, that, that is what so many of us are doing right now. You're like daydreaming about, about traveling and the, the next big thing, but really you're right. It's, it's hard not to focus on also just kind of getting through every day right now too. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just like I said, it's like Groundhog Day. So like every day I'll make sure I come out to the studio at least get something done for this acoustic album, get some video ideas wrote done, just to feel like I'm being creative and and pushing. You know what I mean? I, I find when I get stale, I get stale and just the, uh, yeah, just become like a grump around the house. And my wife's like, what's wrong with you? 
go do something. And, you know, so I, I, I got to keep pushing on. Oh, well, I can't wait to see what's next for you. Uh, Luke, thank you so much for making time for sharing your turning point. Um, and I hope we get a chance to see each other in person. Um, I'm sure you'll be in Toronto uh, touring when this is all over. Definitely will be. I'm hoping. We were supposed to play the Raptors game the week before this whole thing shut down. So I was bringing my daughter up. And yeah, it was going to be a fun trip. But we still got the plane tickets booked because they don't reimburse anything. So uh, I'm coming to Toronto sometime in the next... Well, depends what happens, but hopefully the next five or six months. Okay, well, that sounds good. I hope, I Hopefully I'll get to see you then, uh, and hopefully you'll get to see a Raptors game too when you're here. Yes, I'd like to. Awesome. All right, thanks again so much. I really appreciate you making time for me today. Um, and thanks to all of you who are watching and listening. I hope you'll tune in again next week for another Turning Point story. Until then, take good care of yourselves and of each other.